So, you want to work in a zoo? Well, you're in the right place. We're going to be talking to zookeepers, researchers, conservationists and many more people about their careers. We will discuss how they got into doing what they do now and of course we'll be asking them for their advice to those that aspire to work with animals or for animals and the natural world. With that said, we are joined here by uh, a trio of zookeepers. Take it away then, Matt. Right, so for this episode, we're excited to welcome three of our keepers. These are people for whom a normal day at work will feature dangerous and exotic animals who can safely step behind the scenes to open the cage door to an animal that could peck, bite or kick in quite an uncomfortable manner. Even as kids, we think we know what a zookeeper does, but now is our chance to find out what they really do each day and how they got the job. Now, when I was planning this, I was told off as the guests I had planned were all old. So instead, we've invited three of our younger keepers so that we can hear the careers issues that face them in this decade rather than in the last century. So later in the podcast, we'll be asking them for the absolute worst part of their job. So welcome, Rihanna, Liam and Tom. We'd like to start with a quick round the table. OK, so we'll go around the table. First off, obviously, you are Rihanna. But Rihanna, who are you and what do you do? I'm Rihanna, as has been mentioned. Um, I am a trainee bird keeper, so I look after a whole range of the birds here at Payton Zoo. Excellent stuff, and we'll keep on going with this round, and then I've got one more question for you. So, Tom? I'm Tom. Um, I'm an experienced keeper on the LVI section, which is lower vertebrate and invertebrates, um, and that includes reptiles, amphibians, and creeper crawlies, bugs. Okay, excellent stuff. And Liam? Hello, and I'm Liam, and I'm a qualified keeper on the mammal department. Uh, it could be anything from giraffes to pigs. Excellent stuff. Now, second question I've got for you all is, what is the weirdest job you've ever been employed to do? So, I've had quite a few jobs before here, okay. different places, like, but probably the weirdest, only because it's just a little bit unusual, I don't think it's particularly strange. Um, I worked in a tattoo parlour. Nice. Um, but it was just a case of I would draw up the stencils and okay. answer the phone and make coffees. So <laughs> okay. I, did, I did get to tattoo a pigskin there. So. Okay. But Very not nice. the painful part of tattooing. You didn't get to do the. No, I wanted to. Okay. And like actually, the wife of the guy that had the shop was trying to convince him to let me tattoo his leg, but okay. he said no. I don't know why. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. We'll keep on going around. So, Tom, what's the weirdest part? Um, weirdest. Um, before zookeeping, I worked in the field, so it's probably. I, when I first started out as a labourer, I had to make the teas for everyone, so I was a tea boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to finish 10 minutes early, like before lunch and break, and I had to make about 15 cups of tea. Did you wash the cups up properly? It's building size, so yeah. they just get slung in the, in the gut, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, ready for the next one. Um, but it was quite different, everyone likes teas differently, don't they? So they trying do. to remember how everyone likes their tea. Um, but yeah, probably the weirdest one. Fair enough. And Liam? Uh, mine have just been normal jobs, uh, whether that's just been on the construction site as well, or working at Tesco or working in a cafe, um, yeah, making cups of tea, um, getting grief from customers, <laughs> just, yeah, just the usual really. Fair enough. Just well. a different kind of zoo. Yeah, yeah. the animals here yes. behave better. <laughs> <laughs> they behave as expected, don't they? <laughs> Last time we were together, we were talking about my weird job being shoveling mushroom compost, mm -hmm. but did I tell you about chopping firewood? No. No, okay. It's possibly not the most glamorous job I've ever had. How many hours did you have to chop firewood for? Years. Years? Like a year. Well, yeah, like, yeah. So in a, in a day, yeah. like a long way oh, in no, a day? Like just eight, eight hour day chopping. With an axe? Or no, with a with massive it. machine that oh, okay. shredded your ears. I used to go home from work screaming. See, these days, really when you say that, people will go to TikTok and there are loads of people that have got really famous for just chopping yeah. wood with chops. Chops. Yeah. You get yeah. a lot of money from it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I was about to say, uh, before you mentioned the machinery, but is that your talent? Is that you could give, give you a piece of wood and you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm just going to cut the job. Is it it's Captain it's America? Yeah. <laughs> Terror yeah. apart. The terrifying thing was like on a front row, nearly, nearly dropping a load of logs on my boss. He was, oh my he was a mate, he was a friend. Right? He, he was oh, that over, makes it better. Over, and I just hit the wrong control on it and the grab opened. And... Right, so uh, we wanted to talk to you about being a zookeeper. So we've asked you today, to come on today so we could talk about how you became a zookeeper and the qualifications you needed and the experience and things. So can we just start out just by maybe thinking about how you decided you wanted to be a zookeeper? So maybe Tom, if we can start with you, how, how did you know that you wanted to be a zookeeper? Did you decide? I've always wanted, my dad was a zookeeper. Okay. I always grew up with animals around. So I always had, you know, passion for animals, I think. Um, 
I always like at school when you know you do your yearbook and you get like what do you want to be when you're older. Mine was yeah. always a zookeeper. Okay. I got sidetracked from the you know money and friends yeah. and having a good time and went on to the truck stuff. But I always wanted to be a zookeeper. And I think it was just purely from my upbringing. Right. Okay. So quite a natural animals. choice then. Yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't so much. Like I want. It was more like a passion as, as such. Um, I just wanted to follow what my dad had done. Like I'd seen pictures of him as being a zookeeper, and so I thought that's awesome. Yeah. I wanted okay. to do that, and then yeah, as I've grown into it, it's become more about conservation and all that. Yeah, I think there's some people like the uh, the role models around you, like people you see who you think have got a cool job. That's quite important, right? Because then, like, is it the job that you thought it was going to be? Like when you watched your dad coming home from work and you thought, well, I want to be that. Is it as you please? In some ways, yeah. Right, and then okay. there's other things that you sort of decide you don't see, but then you're like, right. you don't obviously you see them come back and you see. I remember seeing pictures of them hand and tigers and saying, wow, yeah, you don't see them with a wheelbarrow picking up rhino poo, yeah, <laughs> you know. So there's that yeah. side of things that you sort of you realize quite quickly is quite a large part of it, like yeah. cleaning glass, <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> Every man yes, scrubbing the glass, but I spend a lot of time cleaning glass, so. okay, <laughs> yeah, okay, and Rihanna, um, so I can't really say I always wanted to be a zookeeper but I always wanted to work with animals okay. I always loved animals but for some reason it never occurred to me to be a zookeeper I always just thought it's vet or nothing and I couldn't stand the idea of cutting up animals even though yeah. what they do is amazing of course um so I just kind of went off and instead I was like oh maybe I'll do something with art or writing or something like that and then I don't know what it was well actually I do it was when I was going to uni and I realized you could do a zoology course I was just like that sounds amazing and then animal behavior and all that and I just just thought it was really really interesting and then it just kind of went from there okay so you've sort of migrated towards yeah. it whereas Tom always used to loved animals, animals yeah but just I guess I just thought that I wouldn't get it as a job okay so that's pretty great yeah so Liam yourself how do you um, decide I think it's more of a rebellious thing for me um <laughs> so growing up in Manchester the only zoos was like 45 minutes away so I didn't oh, okay. actually go to a zoo till I was in college right okay. oh, wow um so I didn't realise you could actually make a career out of zookeeping. Yeah. Um, I used to watch all the like, the animal park programmes and watch yeah. all the animal documentaries, but I, again, I didn't realise you could make a career out of yeah. it. Um, so it was at the end of high school that I decided to do animal care and then, um, yeah, it kind of progressed from there. And once I knew zookeeping was an option, then it was... Yeah. Um, Did you know anybody who was a zookeeper when you were younger or not? No. Because okay, really, my, like my brother was a keeper yeah. as well. So I, I knew about it. I'm not, I'm not a keeper, but, but he was. So I, I saw him do that. Uh, it didn't put me off, but it was. But it's, it's interesting. You like have ended up doing a job that you didn't know you could do. Yeah, and like my 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 parents aren't really the fondest of animals, right? Um, yeah. So <laughs> that's why I think it's a rebellious thing of me that I yeah. couldn't have a rabbit. So here you go, here's a rhino. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big step up. Yeah, so they've they've kind of warmed to animals now, and it's it's nice seeing that oh, side nice. of things as well. Yeah, um, yeah, it's. Okay, good crew. <laughs> like, Tom, like, I, when we've chatted before, you mentioned about being a bricklayer, right? Yeah. So, like, it's quite a different career. Like, why the change? Like, why why did you change from brickie to... <laughs> I mean, you've got to try to be a brickie anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> it was purely, like I said, I was always into animals. Um, I left school, I did a um, animal course at college. Yeah. And then worked at a reptile shop, so around reptiles. Um, yeah. And then again, as I said, it's just sort of all my friends were working so Monday to Friday, had the weekends off, better pay, working on a construction site. Sort of got sidetracked a little bit, went for that, sort of did that for about sort of five, six years. Okay. Sort of got into it, and then it got to a point where I think I was about 22, 23, had a bad back, and was just like, you know, and all the old boys inside are going, you don't want to be doing this when you're 40. And I just sort of thought, you know, what did I actually want to do? And I wanted to work with reptiles, and so, so I pursued that. So I sort of left the building side, went back to the reptile world and in the shop setting, and then pursued coming over to the zoo side. Yeah. So is it the like just the sheer, like the physical repetitive nature of bricky? Yeah, I think it is. And it's also like, I know I'm quite lucky being a reptile keeper that I work in a tropical house. Yeah. I like warm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's outside when it's raining, and you know, it's cold mornings, getting up early, traveling long distances. Yeah, it just, I mean, it was enjoyable. I like, and I learned loads and I met some great people, but yeah, there was always that bit inside me that wanted to do the, the reptile side okay. of things. Because when, when we mentioned about weirdest jobs and I said about chopping firewood, because I was working for a tree surgeon at the time and you know, my uh, my wife had thought it'd actually be quite a good job for me, but the, being out in all weathers, quite brutal. Yeah. And sometimes you're looking at like roofers being up there in the middle of winter, which <laughs> yeah. is quite harsh. I mean, Liam is a mammal keeper, you're out in all weathers. Rihanna, you're 
pretty much as well. So and Tom's the lucky one then. Yeah, so Tom, I chose <laughs> wisely. You chose very wisely. Living in the tropics yeah. or out in the rain. Yeah, nice hot buildings. That's for me. <laughs> the, like that change when you decided to stop being a bricky and and go go back. So what happened then? Did you just apply for a job? Yeah. So I I I, I was always involved in sort of the reptile industry as such from keeping stuff at home. I always kept stuff at home. Um, managed to get back into the reptile shop to basically just further my knowledge, get back into working with animals. And I applied for a volunteering place here. I applied right. for a job, didn't get it here. And they said, come and get some experience while I volunteering. Yeah. And I took up, uh, did six months full-time volunteering here okay. to gain experience in a zoo environment. Like all sections or? No, so it was just on the LBI, just okay. based on reptiles again. I mean, I've always wanted just to do yeah. reptiles. I've done a bit of mammal work trying okay. to get hours on here, but yeah, it's always been reptiles for me. Okay. Um, so yeah, just volunteer just kept chasing it really. So Liam you went from college like studying animal care and then what? Um, so yeah I, I did uh, my college course and then I went straight to uni. Okay. Um, I was based at Chester University uh, okay. doing zoo management. Oh right um, so you pretty much decided when you were at college like yeah, that's yeah, it I'm gonna go yeah. and study that and then you did like um, yeah, so I did uh, my the two years of a foundation degree, and then I topped it up with a BSc. Okay. Um, so it was just a three-year course um, to gain a bachelor's in science. Um, and then did you uh, like you? So you graduated from university. Yes. And then what? You applied for jobs after that. Or? Um, so between um, between uni, there was the summer holidays. So the first summer holiday, I did some work experience at Blackpool Zoo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I did that for about three months uh, then I gained an education job uh, during the summer period right okay. um, so I did that for a couple months uh, that was again a, a paid reference in a zoo, zoo background yeah um, and then the next summer I did a whole um, volunteering scheme again for the whole summer right okay. um, until when I actually finished university I went to Tesco just for a couple months just to yeah, pay my dues. Yeah, to my um, and then yeah, they they gave me a phone call and said because I did so much volunteering that would I be up for a seasonal job? Yeah, amazing. Um, so that was just going there as a cover keeper at first. But that was on the bird department, the um, mammal department, and going back and forth wherever I was needed. Really, I think like a lot of people who don't work at zoos don't realise that we are basically in, we work in departments that the keepers will often have like a specialist area they either want to work with or end up working with. Like so here is. Uh, reptiles like hoof stock and and birds but then it, there might be other keepers who specialize in that. and like you, you've worked between departments Rihanna you've only worked with birds here or um am I as a zookeeper yeah. but yeah different jobs in yeah but then you keep area. reptiles at home yeah, right? so, yeah okay. so, that's good. so Rihanna in terms of you getting the experience to become a zookeeper did you did you volunteer did you yes I started volunteering when I was 11 Wow. So I actually, can see a common theme. <laughs> in three. Yeah, yeah, basically, um, we moved to Devon from the West Midlands, mm -hmm. and we visited a bird of prey centre. Very Devon nice. Bird of prey centre. Funnily enough, um, we were actually going to Fermoys, and then noticed that was there. And was like, oh, birds! Brilliant. <laughs> I went in and um, thought it was absolutely amazing. I held a barn owl for a pound. I don't okay. think you can do that anymore, but. That was cool. You could do about fiver. <laughs> yeah. And I basically asked the girl that was doing it, oh, how old do you have to be to start volunteering here? And she's like, seven years old, I guess. I was like, I'm 11. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> so I volunteered every single Saturday for four years. Um, and then I only left because it was like, okay, you know, I've learned everything I can yeah. here for the moment. And I'm, you know, want to move on and do other things. Um, and then I did actually volunteer here as well. Um, and Living Coast, when Living Coast was a thing, um, in the education department. So I was, um, but I also volunteered for a short amount of time. I think it was only like about less than six months um, on the bird department. So okay. I did sort of see the birds years ago before I even started working with them. Yeah. Okay. So um, touching on qualifications, because you've all mentioned uh, like about studying. A lot of people, if they're at school or uh, sort of think about leaving school or even if you think about changing careers you need to know what qualifications you need uh, but also like what qualifications people have got because sometimes they're different right you mm -hmm. know I've worked with zookeepers who had absolutely no qualifications or had fine art degrees so uh, Liam you mentioned you've got a like a degree in in zoo animal management uh, yeah right. zoo management okay cool yeah. right <laughs> and like Tom, did you study? Like you so I did. I did a year at Sparshall just okay. when I left school. Um, yeah. I gave that up stupidly. <laughs> yeah. um, and then I've since been at the zoo. I've done the diploma in 
management of zoological aquarius at the DIMSA. Yeah, so okay. qualification for zookeepers. Right, so DIMSA, like it's something we, we, we use all the time here at work, yeah. like we'll be chatting about DIMSA, but that's the diploma in management of zoological and aquaria. Okay, and that's basically like the a qualification that you can do while you're working that you st like do you study at home or what? Yeah, so it's um, you have to do. I think you have to be employed by a zoo or, a, yeah. or an animal institution. Um, and then I did mine at home, so it was all from my home as such. I went to spa shop for a week, right, to do okay. like a course, or like a, a week crash course as such, and then you just um, upload modules onto the um, online. Okay, so okay. you're stu studying and normally working at the yeah, same time, so and then yeah. gradually get that. And that's that's quite a popular qualification for. Yeah, I think it's the one that all zoos push for. Yeah. Um, I think it might have slightly changed now. But yeah, so I was extremely lucky that Peyton supported me yeah. for going through and doing that. Um, but yeah, it's all done from home. It's all off your own sort of back. Yeah. Um, but there, you have to be part of a, a zoological institute because you, you have a test halfway through right at the end of the first year. Yeah. And then you have to do um, like pictures of your work and like a portfolio of yeah. sort of practical work. Um, so if you don't work in a zoo environment, it's quite hard to yeah. provide that. Okay. Um, so yeah. But I'd recommend it to anyone. Okay. Really good. Rihanna? Um, yeah, so I'm going to say something controversial first. Okay. Um, Go ahead. I don't think you need any educational experience. <gasps> I know. Yeah. I think you should have because yeah. it's really interesting. It's amazing. And it will give you that edge when you yeah. are having mm -hmm. an interview. But there are so many people I know that just have, like like you said, work with animals. Say, entire I, agree, life. Yeah, I don't think you have to have it or need no. it. Okay. Um, it shouldn't be something that puts you off if you haven't got a degree. Yeah. in animals but I definitely recommend it like 100% I love studying yeah. I don't want to stop yeah. um, but I um, I did a bachelor's in animal behaviour and then I did a master's in zoo conservation biology and I'd like to do a PhD okay well that was going to be one of the questions was you know are you going to study more but you have you finished your DIMSA? yeah finished my DIMSA okay. a couple of years back now yeah um, Yeah. I mean I'd like to study more but I'm a nightmare at studying right okay. yeah I struggle with it really like this classroom setting, which is why I think this appeals to me, like the practical side of things. Yeah. yeah. But I would like to. I mean, I'd love to be a PhD. I'd love to be a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know if it'll ever happen. Yeah. <laughs> free, yeah. One day, maybe. Quite a lot. It's uh, things like the PhD. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, work, right? Yeah. Exactly. But if you're interested in it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. See, I thought that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah. I mean, I think it's just writing and sitting down. I think it's oh, having yeah, it's like discipline as well, like setting yeah. you yourself an hour and you get back from work to do it. Yeah. I was always. Yeah. Would you do a different qualification if you were starting now? I think if I if I could go back, I mean, yeah. I think I would have pursued the college, the university, with like Liam has. Okay. Um, but yeah. like that animal care and yeah, animal care and, and the, the zoology zoo and stuff. Yeah. Like that. I think Bangor University do a great herpetology course. Okay. I'd love yeah. to do that. Yeah, I I studied at Bangor and I did herpetology as part of my degree there yeah. with like some amazing lectures. And the, the silly thing was that at the time I didn't realise how special that was, what that opportunity mm. was. And even now, I know things about herpetology that I didn't know I knew from studying. Yeah, yeah. I, I went to uni and then ended up sort of, you know, changing jobs. That's something that, like, just on a slightly different note, that's brilliant about working here is the connections that you make. Yeah. Because, for instance, as you said, I have reptiles. So I'm on certain groups online where we talk about them and we share these certain papers about certain uh, diets and things like that. And then for my dissertation before COVID hit, um, I was going to be talking to somebody that wrote the paper, yeah. which was pretty nice. amazing. Because then it was like meeting the celebrity sort of yeah. thing. Um, so that was quite cool. Yeah, okay. So you're actually meeting the not the people who had the knowledge to write. Yeah, that done right all now. this research okay. and that all you know, the people that you quote about these subjects, and it was like, Oh yeah, we'll we'll get you in touch with them, we'll talk to them to do your yeah. Okay. <laughs> No, actually, that might be a good time to ask this question. I was going to ask it later on, but you, like, you've got lizards at home. Mm -hmm. Like, like for for each of you, have you got like something? What what animal like bugs you when you go home? What animal do you go home and you're thinking, <laughs> like, I need to read a little bit more about that? Or is there like you know, like Tom, if you're looking after reptiles, is there an animal where you're like, okay, I need to figure this out? Um, yeah, I think there's always something that yeah. you want to know. Um, or something that might have popped up, whether it's like particularly with reptiles and amphibians, whether it's sort of seasonal changes and mm. in terms of how people do that, like or right. The seasonal changes help the reptiles to breed, right? You can stimulate yeah, so the reptiles you can, to um, breed. Basically, cycle so seasonal cycles. So a lot of the places they come from, it's like wet and dry season. So particularly yeah. with amphibians, a lot of them require a lots of rainfall. So okay. you're always sort of like, well, how do other people do that? And you go and read about it. If we've got a new species coming in that I don't really know a lot about or haven't worked with before. I normally go and. You know, quiz people that yeah. I know and how, how have you done this or look how other people do it. 
and I think oh I've got loads of books at home as well like so I mean you said about like not liking studying when you were at school but it, but you've you still got to like as part of your job, you've got to kind of take on that technical information, haven't you? Yeah. Because people think, like, when I was chatting about this podcast, people were, like, in, even in the office, we were chatting about the fact that people think that zookeepers, like, some people think that zookeepers just come here and shovel poo. And that, that's just not true. <laughs> like, if you're trying to get a species to breed, you've got to know how to get it to live, you know, to stimulate it to breed, yeah. right? So it might be... Like, I think that's the difference in the sort of modern-day zookeeping, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I think way back in the day, it was sort of we kept things in fields yeah. we used to pick up the poo and that be it whereas now we sort of try and keep a much more naturalistic environment so try yeah. and recreate you know habitat niches in like it's picking reptiles in like a small little tank yeah so therefore you have to go up and read about how to get rainfall and not so you know soak the bottom of your tank and you yeah know, stuff like that um but yeah i think if you're really interested in something cause like i read all the time about reptiles but yeah. when it comes back to the study and things like if i sat, someone said sat down and you got to write it would be like nah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a new thing coming, and I want to learn how to try yeah. and achieve something. I go home and read about it. All yeah, it's also good about modern zoo as well is that everything is developing on a daily basis. So there's new research out there coming out on a daily basis yeah. that you wouldn't have even thought about, which will benefit the animals' housing, mm. the, will benefit the behaviour. The so is that on like on the internet, or is it? Do you pick it up at work, or or what? Is um, it's mostly online. I see. I, um, I think Facebook's actually brilliant. Right. Like, okay. I found quite a lot of scientific papers on Facebook. Like they literally just did one out in America on catching crocodiles. Okay. And like the um, the levels of their um, lactic acid when you catch them in terms of different methods, and like, read that, and I just got that off Facebook. Right. Okay. So if, think, if people are interested at home, they could be. Like yeah. browsing through social media and yeah, just... social media is often quite helpful. And okay, it can be really helpful. Okay, I think it's quite a big tip actually. So if you're interested in being like a zookeeper, then by following like some of the keeper groups on Facebook, I mean you can actually get an idea of what's going on. Yeah, that's going to also give you an idea of like what animals are most interesting to you, right? And changes. You also get a realistic view as well on Facebook. Yeah, okay. Like you, you hear personal opinions. Yeah. Um, yeah. And whether that's bad or good, you get <laughs> you get both opinions to make your own judgment. Yeah, um, yeah. But then you can also refer back to Google Scholar and search up anything that you'd like. Yeah. Um, like I've got um, alerts set up on Google Scholar. So, for example, I have um, like rhino enrichment or giraffe enrichment, and uh, on a weekly basis, if any new articles that are posted, um, okay. I will instantly get a um, an email saying that these new searches have come up this week. Right, okay. So I mean, all right, okay. Hold, like, so when we were chatting about it, and I was saying about it, some people think that zookeepers are just shoveling poo mm. like that's like the opposite of it. if you've got a google <laughs> scholar alert set up that is, that is telling you if there's a uh, like a research article or mm. something that, that is published that's going to help you to look after your animals and stimulate their natural behavior more that's like the opposite of mm. that right so it's quite interesting you know when you're at school and people say oh well, you don't want to be a zookeeper because that's just shoveling poo that's, that's yeah. really not yeah, because it is, it is time consuming, but it's yeah. development on yourself because yeah. whatever your quality of work is their quality of life. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah, in work, we will do the, the poo shoveling, yeah. um, <laughs> being weed on all the time by a yeah, okay. um, <laughs> but, but, yeah, when you're in your, when I'm in my own time, I quickly just, it, it's not time, well, being at home, it's not time consuming because you literally look at the, the statistics of, of, a, of a journal. Yeah, and okay. You get the results straight away. Just give you ideas. Yeah. Fair enough. This podcast is brought to you by Wild Planet Trust, a conservation charity based in the southwest of the UK with zoos in Paynton and Newquay, local and national nature reserves, and field projects in the UK, Tanzania, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Vietnam, and Sulawesi. You can find out more on our website, www.wildplanettrust.org.uk. So, Rihanna, just coming to you, if, for those who don't think that uh, zookeeping is about shopping poo, some of them just think that you get to cuddle animals all day, but like, can you tell me about an animal that's been like, maybe troubling you, like, where you've been thinking, right, okay, I, there's something, I, I wonder what I can learn about it to mm-hmm. help me care for it. Yeah, um, you do get to cuddle some animals, okay. but yeah, the, the <laughs> ones that probably aren't a good idea to cuddle that I've been pondering about um, are the marabou storks, right, okay. Okay. so they've started yeah, we'll cuddle, nest building. And um, they're quite, like in the wild and in captivity, they're quite aggressive. So can I be blunt and say this is a uh, five foot 
tall. It's very white. tall, impressive, uh, ugly looking birds. Yes, <laughs> no, ugly. I, I think they're beautiful. They're Long beak. Really ugly. Like they, I mean, they are yeah, they're not, they're not the prettiest. They carry themselves like an undertaker. They are, yes. So, but they okay. are very impressive and that's why I love them so much because I, I'm very short. I don't know if you okay. can tell on the camera, <laughs> but they're like up here on me and it's just very impressive. But yeah, so they're at the moment, they're quite aggressive towards one another because yeah. it's breeding season and that's quite normal. And obviously it's a case of watching and seeing how much aggression is okay and mm -hmm. when to separate them. And I think sometimes it can be quite difficult with the public because you want to explain to them like, look, we know that they're being aggressive, but that's normal. And yeah. like, it's under control. We are constantly watching them. But um, so yeah, learning about that is really interesting. But also, um, on a separate note, not to do with breeding season or anything like that, um, it'd be really nice. We've been talking about training the marabous to step on scales and things like that because there's very little information out there on like weights of birds like this. Um, so it'd be cool for us to contribute. We might not be able to compare it to anything, but maybe other people could compare theirs to ours and then see what's what because it's quite a big thing in the bird world at the moment with diets. We're kind of rehauling everything that we thought we knew and changing it all up and there's lots of information out there but there's not there's not like a guide yeah to okay diets and also a lot of them are based on well this is what we've done for years yeah and so it's our job to sort of like you said it's not nobody sat me down and said research this diet but it's something that i want to do because i want to give my animals the best okay. possible yeah and I want to know, I want to know what they're supposed to be eating, but there's such little research in the wild. There's a lot of information about captivity, but we need to obviously base it on the wild. Mm -hmm. okay. now, uh, changing topics, I was keen to get like a, like a true impression of what the job's like day to day. So just as a sort of brief section, I was just going to ask you, what's the best bit of your, of your job? Like, you know, in a day, well, not, not just in a day, but what's the best bit of your job? When somebody down the pub says, what's the best bit? What do you do today? What are you really pleased to say? Um, I would say when an animal recognises you, um, okay, right. working on a daily basis, um, you can, for example, the Red River Hogs in the Mammal Department, mm -hmm. um, you could literally shout their names over and they would recognise my Northern Twang <laughs> um, yeah. and instantly Radish and Winnie will run over, um, I was about to say onking them, but uh, yeah. the, yeah. whatever noise they make, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, just wait there looking at me, wagging their tails. Okay. Uh, Tom, do you get that or not? I, I'm a bit of a feeder, I just like feeding stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. like, especially the crocs, uh, I don't think you can oh, beat yeah, the crocodiles. Um, but another training. Um, oh, okay. I quite right, like so training. training. So I've, we've managed to train the dragon to come to a whistle. Right, okay, so a Komodo dragon will yeah, actually so, come on a Yeah, so we've recall, uh, trained her to come into her den. Yeah. So if we need to remove the exhibit at any point of the day, regardless of whether she's got a full belly or she's extremely hungry. Yeah. Hungry. Um, you just blow yeah. her a whistle and she comes running. Run up to dead. Okay. Depending on, on what station, if she's got a big belly, she sort of slowly ponders. Right, okay. If she's hungry, she comes far enough. Yeah. Okay, so it's a sort of pride thing there of actually getting the. Well, yeah, I mean, I think done. people look at, particularly lizards and stuff, and like quite silly, um, yeah. or like not as clever as maybe some of the primates or the apes. But I mean, to train a lizard to come to a whistle, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's yeah, one yeah, of the I first things. Yeah. Down the pub, it's one of the first things I yeah. say, like, oh, I fed the crop, or, you know, I just yeah. blew a whistle and a dragon came running over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rihanna? I think definitely getting close to the animals, like okay. you said, them recognising you, um, that's pretty cool. And I think also noticing something and thinking, okay, I wonder if I can do something with that and then give them enrichment and then they're able to express behaviours that you've probably never seen before. That's yeah. really satisfying. And it can be just little silly things like um, the birds in Desert House. I noticed when I take my wheelbarrow through, I've got these little egg cups and I kept hearing them messing with them and they love playing with them. There's no food in them by that point. Yeah. It's already been put out, but they just love manipulating things with their beak. So I've started putting out enrichment for them where they have to, you know, really use their beak. Okay. And we've got like these little boxes that you can hide treats inside. But even if you don't put treats in them, if you just put it out there, they're and just, they just play with it. Yeah. Amazing. And that's really interesting. Yeah. The other day I walked around the corner and there were two uh, budgies that had only just recently fledged and they had no idea I was there and they were playing with feathers that were on the floor and it was just <laughs> right, so, so satisfying. witnessing just like animals uh, relaxed. Okay. Yeah. Now the flip side, I was going to ask what's the worst part of your job but let's go with what's the part of your job that you are most happy that your colleagues do and you don't? Like when you go home and you're like, oh yeah, I didn't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Glad it wasn't me. Well. So what's the bit of your job that you're most happy to palm off? <laughs> oh God, that's a, um, 
I'd say drains any day. Drains? drains. Oh, okay. Well, it's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. clearing even, out the drains. Yeah, yeah. even yeah. when you wear gloves, you, it, it lingers on your fingers for mm. days. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, no. drains. Window cleaner, maybe. <laughs> you mentioned earlier, it's like a weird section. job, right? Well, I suppose obviously yeah. most reptiles you are, are, yeah. in, are inside yeah. like an exhibit, yeah. so it's a, it's a lot of glass. Well, even... Like I was doing a video back along, which was following keepers for a day, and in every section there is a pane of glass to be cleaned <laughs> yeah. on a regular basis. Well, I think LVI, but LVI have yeah, probably yeah, got yeah, the, uh, drawn the short straw on that one. And then summer months and like yeah, everyone always kids always have an ice cream, and yeah. then you just got ice cream uh, smears. Okay. Glass, you know, <laughs> is it the fingers or the noses? Yeah, it's everything. Um, <laughs> so I've actually seen a footprint higher. <laughs> like, How is that happening? <laughs> I actually found a footprint. Oh, okay. These are summer periods when they wear sun cream. Everybody wears sun cream. Oh, yeah. 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 You can see it yeah. everywhere. Yeah. You have to do every single pain. It's just, by the end of it, you're just like, I'm done. so done. And then you go on to the next room, and then it's like... <laughs> <laughs> it's like... No, then. Uh, okay, I don't want to encourage competition Where between the parts. Oh, go on then. No, okay, watch it. <laughs> and it's a really part. terrible job. Right. Um, it's literally just uh, the sluice gates. I absolutely hate doing them. Which right, is... So when we've got streams that run through the yeah. zoo and the birds are in there. Yeah, and most of them are fine. You just sort of lift up a bit and all the rubbish, like Goes cabbage through, and, and stuff comes down and like, you know, sticks and all. But the worst one is right at the bottom um, by the peli slab and the gorillas because you have to get in with waders. Okay. And obviously you have to do it when there's high rain right so you're there it's freezing cold it's wet you've got your your waders on um the gloves never used to be waterproof which they are now thankfully okay. that they weren't so you have water down your arm and you're just there trying to shovel all these leaves and branches out and i just hate it <laughs> so yeah that's fun okay Are that you'd be particularly keen then or pleased because i saw pete smallbones the curator the other oh, day it's doing, great when he does doing that job so you I like, I like to Watch yeah. 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 my phone, like, <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else doing the job. Okay. So, so whenever I'm sad, I just look at it and I'm like, <laughs> I didn't have to do that. Either. So, not in, I don't, didn't want to encourage competition between your departments, but we are, you know, as Wild Planet Trust, we're trying to help help species decline. So, we work with some really endangered species here. So, what's the most endangered animal, sorry, the most endangered species that you work with? Sakara dove, 100%. Okay. They Which are. Is? It's a very pretty looking dove. It's got a kind of um, almost like a caramel colour to okay. their feathers. Absolutely gorgeous. Unfortunately, you can't see them at the moment. You used to okay. be able to. They used to be where the toucans are, but they um, are off show at the moment. Okay. And but endangered? They are extinct in the wild. Extinct in the wild, right. So okay. there's only about 100 left. We okay. used to think there were more. That's just in captivity. But we've realised that a lot of them, unfortunately, have hybridised. So they've bred with similar species and aren't you know, okay. fully Saccharid mm. so, so working with a species extinct in the wild. Liam, yes. can you repeat that? Um, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> I say, I think but then you're working I'm with... Pretty sure, like, yeah, because uh, I'm pretty sure the most endangered is just uh, the eastern bongo. Okay, which is um, critically endangered, yeah, critically right? endangered, yeah. Okay. Not extinct in the wild. <laughs> yeah. Winning so far. Right, but if you're working with eastern bongo, critically endangered means that scientists think there's a like a high risk of it going extinct in the wild in the next three generations, so normally sort of the next 30, 40 years. That's just yeah, it's pretty bad at the moment. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, not not as not as bad as the okay. extinct in the wild. So maybe that's the wrong person first. You see, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. should have worked up to me. So it's tricky though, isn't it? Because in terms of like, what's the most endangered? That in terms of how many are left, or is yeah. it in terms of what threats they mm. face? Well, bit, in terms ooh, of like, no, the relevance see. of it, because you if you to. look at like current climate, island yeah. species are pretty at risk with change of climate, um, sea levels rising, um, and then like with we've got a lesser Antillean iguana. Right. Mm. That's suddenly now being able to hybridise with a green iguana, which is invasive on the island. So now that's a massive issue, which could decimate. Um, okay. We've got the Naguru spiny chameleons. I believe they're like data deficient, so it's like just no one's been out there to find. No, so one that's knows. The scary no one. Knows. That's yeah. So, like Tom, I, I think you're underselling yourself because you also work with Anam leaf turtles, right? That's a species that's critically endangered in the wild. Like experts are wondering whether it's actually extinct in the wild, and they're uh, so many have been collected for food that they we can't safely put them back. But you work with them here, right? Are they breeding here or? So we have a mixed group, but um, one of the things with Anam leaf turtles is the captive populations. It's particularly in the UK, it's quite large. Okay, so you um, can breed them in captivity, yeah. we can look after them here, and then when the threat's gone, then maybe one day we'll... Yeah, so we're trying to mitigate the risks. Okay. Okay, so when they do go back, we can ensure... Yeah, because they're going back to a safe situation. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, when we talk about us as zoos and trying to breed rare species, we, like we can't send them back when they face more danger. So once the problems are sorted for the Socorro dove and um, leaf turtle, even with the bongos maybe, then, then there's further down the line, there might be a chance for a re-release, but not, not right now. Okay, moving on to a less serious subject here. Okay, um, uh, if you weren't working in conservation, so if you weren't working as a zookeeper, what would you be? Um, Do we get to choose? Yeah, like yeah, anything. yeah, anything. anything. <laughs> Astronaut. Astronaut? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, mine's still, yeah, mine's still revolved around that, but I'd like to be a wildlife photographer. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think that's awesome. I mean, yeah. You, well, especially when you watch like, Planet Earth, you know the bit at the end. Yeah. So I think that's... Yeah, that's it's cameraman's diary. Sitting in a tree for like three days watching elephants yeah. spinning, she seems like... Yeah, don't wild. tell Ollie, I'm quite jealous of his time. Do that every day on a budget. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Liam? Um, I don't know whether mine's quite boring, but it's completely different to animals, even though I wouldn't go give up this job uh, at all. Um, I'd like to become a tailor. I love suits. So okay. Yeah. Oh, that's and I think it's, yeah. again, it's a rebellious thing because working outside, uh, covered in poo, uh, having to deal with all rain, like any weather conditions. That, yeah. It's the opposite of that. Yeah. Probably just completely the opposite. Yeah, probably, just, probably just envy a little. Uh, do you do any upholstering like at home or like? No, no. Don't do anything like that. You should maybe start making your own suits. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Be, Right now, would be nice. <laughs> really astronaut or? No, you go? Okay. I'd like to be a writer. Okay, writer, okay, fair enough. You'd know all about that. Yeah, I would, but astronaut's easier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, uh, okay, let's round up with, I, we should, we're near the end of the podcast. So I wanna ask you just a couple more questions. One is like, there's sacrifices when you work here. Like we're working for a charity, it's conservation, then, you know, compared to your friends, what, what are the sacrifices here? I mean, Tom, you mentioned about being a brickie being physically hard work, but what's the other sacrifices for being a keeper? I suppose the, the days you work. So yeah. A lot of my friends are Monday to Friday people. I mean, and it's also, well, if you want to chase a career in zookeeping, and like you've moved down from Blackpool, and you have to sort of try and take opportunities where they mm. sort of become available. So because you, you may need to move to you take to the move, work. Yeah, so I'm originally from Southampton. Okay. So I moved down to Devon to pursue this career. So yeah. I can't in an evening go out and see my friends as such. Yeah. I would make friends here obviously, but yeah. You know, so that side of it's kind of tricky. And the other thing you mentioned hours, which is that a lot of you, everybody as a zookeeper tends to work on a rotor, right? Yeah, Including yeah, weekends. Work. Yeah. Uh, not so many evenings, right? It's not like you're working like you don't work late often, but it tends to be that you're working a lot of weekends and that's quite relevant for a lot of people if they're choosing their careers. Anything else that you can think of? I don't know. Mm. No, I think the main thing here is is family and friends. Yeah. Well, you you make your own kind of non-blood family down here yeah um but yeah i think 50 percent of zookeepers move to to progress in their career yeah um, yeah like again i'm from manchester but the the closest zoos are like 45 minutes to an hour away yeah um so yeah i went to uh, i don't think i've been back home fully since i was 18 right um okay. so i went to uni for three years then blackpool for yeah. three years and then i wouldn't have expected that to... as like one of your sacrifices mm -hmm. i was expecting you to say hours like physically hard but not really having to move to get the expertise, like to get the job and to get the, the opportunities. Okay, so that's interesting. Yeah, yeah one day, uh, Sunday roast every Sunday at my parents, but, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, career comes yeah. first. Yeah, I think yeah. it would be like, wouldn't it be perfect if you could do what you do now, yeah. but then be able to go home and be able to pop down the pub and see your childhood friends, and, yeah. or be able to pop around your mum's on Sunday yeah. roast. Like most, yeah, most of keepers go, like after 15 years experience, do go back around their, their family and friends. Okay. Um, like yeah, a zookeeper has just left last week um, to go back into the Midlands. Yeah. Um, she's been away for 15, 20 years, but yeah. So work with the animals, get your expertise, mm -hmm. and then hopefully you get to sort of choose where you want to work then yeah. more. Okay. Okay, so this is a complete change of tack here, which will, like when you're at school and your careers advisors are talking to you about the skills that you require for your job. Okay, if I was uh, trying to list the jobs, skills for a zookeeper, what skills do you use that you didn't expect to have to use? Um, the one that... I guess was quite naive of me not to realise was to be physically fit. Right, okay. Like I took weeks to get used to the keeper. I literally just job. trotting around the zoo. I would just go home and go to sleep. Yeah. I literally just <laughs> I did it for ages. Yeah. And now like you know, like lugging around wheelbarrows and things like that and but you, you do once you're used to it, you're used to it sort yeah. of thing. But it took me a while because I'm I'm I don't exactly I'm not one of these people that goes out exercising. Yeah. <laughs> I do now because of the zoo. Painting is a hard one though, isn't it? It's yeah. Really everywhere you go there's a hill especially this because site because you care yeah. so much you don't want to like slow anyone down and you want to get it done how they do it and you want to do it properly as well so yeah it's i wasn't 
kind of prepared for how physical it was going to be. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes it bites you in the bum because if, if you book off holiday or if you have your days off, um, you'll slob for those days. Yeah, because you want to recover. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Then, then your first day back in, your legs are oh, like, and so you eat tired rubbish. the first day. <laughs> you eat yeah. lots of sugar because mm. you're trying to get the energy back. Right. Yeah. Anything oh, else you think of? Like, what about organisation or... Yeah. Organisation's a big one for, yeah. for like in terms of getting stuff done, big projects especially, like right. redoing or moving an animal around to make sure it's all organised. Right, because so, if you're moving an animal maybe to another collection then paperwork and Yeah, pre export testing, um, to organise that for vets, etc. Um, pre export testing. So like actually testing the animal to make sure it's healthy before it's moved to another collection. Yeah, free of disease. Um, okay. Yeah. I think computer skills are becoming more and more important. Like basic Excel skills that you yeah. probably develop when you're working here and things like that as well, especially if you're studying. Yeah. Um, Wait, what are you using Excel for? Do you... So for instance, um, I used it really heavily um, with my dissertation. Yeah. Um, we're doing like about animal personalities, which obviously yeah. is kind of linked in. Um, Did you use it here or? We do. We yeah. use it for like working out dosing frog tanks. We put mm. like a formula into Excel and then we change sort of how many buckets of water we've taken out and it'll right. tell us what we need to put back in to get the okay. right water parameters. Okay, so like actually, uh, I hadn't even thought of that, which is that if you're caring for a frog and you need to change like something simple about it, you may need to actually calculate. Yeah, because obviously they come from Lake Titicaca, for instance, they come from a particular lake that has certain water parameters. You have to try and match that in captivity. So right. you basically get it to that. So you know, when, when your maths teacher at school is telling you, but maths is really important. You will need to use this. Is that actually you may need to use it weirdly to look to get the water quality right for a frog that you're caring for? <laughs> yeah, right, so I know that's a roundabout way of saying it, but it, yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, you might not use algebra and find yeah. out what x means, but you will need. But you may need to, yeah. to get Excel to do that for you. Okay. Yeah, I think the good thing about being a zookeeper and doing it though is it's a lot more fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you're trying to figure yeah, it out yeah. for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like diet sheets as well. There's um, an Excel sheet that I had that you could put in like the BMI and it'll work out how much energy for different types of animals, okay. whether they're active or not and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And like, you know, if somebody could create one of them for birds, that'd be amazing because this one's mainly mammals. So right. I you think, sorry, sorry, go on. Have you seen Alex's one on Excel for the enrichment for the apes? Um, no. See, oh, have a look at that, that's incredible. Okay, so an Excel spreadsheet that tells yeah, you. Yeah, you basically put in, it's got these formulas, and you put in what enrichment you've got, what, um, how they reacted to it, and then it gives you like, on the site it's got a big pie chart in terms of, uh to see how they reacted to it and then whether you were using too much of one type of enrichment is really clever. Right, so hold on, this is Zookeepers, <laughs> like actually... Yeah, yeah it's, you have to see it, it's awesome. This is Zookeepers actually taking Excel and then using it, like this is a real life example of them using it to basically improve the life of the animals they look after, that they do actually, so your maths teacher is not lying to you. <laughs> they say you need IT skills and you need yeah. math skills. So actually looking at how well uh, an ape appreciates the enrichment you're giving it. Yeah, if sure. you end up having a stud book as well, yeah. then you're going to go really into yeah. it. Then you look at diversity of animals and who's related to who and okay. all that sort of thing as well. Then it gets really important. Okay, now I'm getting lost. <laughs> yeah. It's maybe a good time to ask a final question. So Ollie, over to you. So, classic one for any advice podcast, and we say it in every episode. What would be your advice for your 15-year-old self? <laughs> Nobody wants to say. Um, so I would definitely say two things. Mm -hmm. One right. is um, don't stop. Don't. It sounds really cheesy. Don't give up. But you know, I actually it's probably not something good to say, but I failed science okay. in right. secondary That's school uh, quite a few times. I had to keep. I had to keep <laughs> retaking it. But because I, you know, carried on, and my yeah. teachers kept saying to me you would do really well in uni, it's just this, it's notoriously difficult. A level yeah. of biology is really difficult. Yeah. Um, but you know, I did it and because my other grades were quite high, they let me go to uni, let yeah. me go to uni, you know. Um, and so, I did you, really well. so you failed science? I failed science and maths. Got... <laughs> we were just talking BSC. about Excel sheets and all. And an MSc. And my MSc was in a maths yeah. based, it was a maths based um, dissertation as okay. well. So, so perseverance. Yes, perseverance, going. 100%. And also jump at every opportunity. Yeah, like yeah, I've yeah. been at the zoo for almost five years and I've done lots of different jobs. Yeah. And some jobs I really enjoyed. I worked in education, yeah. which I'm, you know, I'm so glad I tried it. I, I was presenting and I never thought that would be something that I would do. Yeah. Um, I've been a cleaner here. 
And you know, it's all given me experience and confidence with talking to people and things like that. And I'm just so glad I did them. Like I've represented the zoo in different places. I've done a little bit of teaching as well. Yeah. And I think that's really good because it shows that, you know, you're open to trying new things. And also you don't know you're gonna enjoy something sometimes unless you give yourself the yeah. opportunity. Okay, so try stuff, perseverance. Tom, what would you advice for your 15 year old self? Uh, study harder. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Maybe take it a bit more seriously, school and that um, yeah. would be mine. Okay. Yeah. I think, yeah, because I think if you look, like I said, with the building site, so sort of that tangent, yeah. I think if I would continue, maybe I'd come out of, you know, similar to what you've done, and probably would have ended up in the same place, but it'd be nice to have that sort of background, and it certainly helps when it comes to writing daily reports, if you know how to write, um, you know, yeah. for that, so if you, yeah, study harder would be mine. Okay, it's a very serious one, but yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 it's okay, because, do you know, it's when, they, when people are nagging you when you're younger, you know, then. Yeah, it's, well, yeah, I always always ask school, like, learning. Boring, yeah. so they wanted to go out and play football. Whereas I tell myself now just to stick at it for another five years, and then yeah. you know, you've got your whole life after that to go and do what you want. Mm. But whilst you've got an opportunity to go to college, university, without having right, so to pay for it, yeah, like yeah, true. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, mine's probably the same as Ryan's. It's uh, persistence. Uh, I was terrible at high school, um, <laughs> I didn't get the grades I wanted, um, had to work my way up from, from the the lowest grade of college to the highest okay. um, just because a subject at school isn't for you like don't feel down on yourself like you you will be it's just not the subject for you yeah um, you'll find kind of your niche okay so find the subject that you like or that, yeah. you, that you're good at as well yeah and then yeah then like I, I know uh, zookeepers that did a uh, week volunteering and gained a job um, I did right. a year and a half of volunteering and gained a job yeah um, I know a 46 year old lady that but started her volunteering at that age yeah. uh, and gained a zookeeping job at the end of it. Um, it's never too late to do zookeeping or anything um, career that you want to do. That's yeah, it. okay. That's fair enough. So thank you very much for coming and talking to us today on uh, So You Want to Work at a Zoo. So all really good advice. Thank you very much, of course, for joining us. That's all we have time for today. So yeah, well, thank you for your time. Thank you for having us. Yeah, yes, thank, thank you. you. Right, cheers. Thank you so much for listening or watching our podcast. If you enjoyed it, please consider leaving us a review or if you're watching, please hit the like button and leave us a comment about your favorite part of the episode. To get more content from Wild Planet Trust, please consider checking out our YouTube channel. You can subscribe there and you can also subscribe to our newsletter on our website. Of course, you can find Wild Planet Trust, Painting Zoo and Nuki Zoo on all main social media platforms and we'd really appreciate you checking those out as well. All that's left to say is thank you very much for watching and of course we'll see you in the next episode.